Good evening, all. Uh, we are approaching the 10th anniversary of Laudato Si, and I have a very specific memory of uh, having read it a few times and then being struck by it, its enthusiastic reception. And uh, I was living with Brother Bill Short, who's on this call, and I said to him, look, Bill, it's great that Pope Francis is getting all of this um, in uh, kudos for uh, Laudato Si, but I've been teaching about this for some 20 years. And he looked at me wryly as he stepped out the door. He said, ah, yes, but you do not have a white hat. No, I don't have a white hat, and I'm just fine with that. But what I do want to do is share with you a little bit about what I'll be uh, talking about this evening is to is to take some take a perspective of what um, Loud Out to See has to offer and, and with the perspective of 10 years now. And so um, here's what my uh, my hopes are for the uh, for the presentation. What can we say about Loud Out to See here 10 years out? How does the call for renewal uh, fit within Pope Francis's more general um, teaching about renewal in our current um, time and place? And um, then I want to conclude by talking a little bit about Chapter 6, which is really uh, an excellent summary of uh, Laudato Si um, and, and the spirituality that I think flows from it. So I'll, I'll be returning to this, um, to this uh, little uh, PowerPoint in just a second. We'll be going back and we'll be going back and forth on that. So, um, Laudato Si is the longest encyclical ever written. It's long at two hundred forty-eight some uh, some paragraphs. It provides um, an integral view of um, of of Catholic social thought for the world. It was released in twenty fifteen, really as a way to give. Uh, input to the United Nations as it negotiated the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, and also the Paris Treaty Accords, which made some modest progress towards um, towards a climate uh, action. And so it it had uh, it it provided an urging to take action to take action using a, a moral appeal and um, providing religious instructions to do that. Many people commented that it was valuable because it was a different kind of intervention than um, what had typically been the case in those large international ne negotiations, which was really more of a technocratic or kind of like very specific technological instructions. And this uh, this encyclical from Pope Francis was inviting everyone to renewal. Why was it so influential? And it, in, um, and it was... Uh, um, it had a universal audience. It was trying to speak to everyone. Um, it had a certain kind of moral clarity that reframes the poverty versus uh, in, uh, environmental protection uh, debate as uh, it with a with a sense of holis, holism as being an integral set of requiring an integrated set of problems. But as I said, it's the it was a, it's the most influential encyclical ever released by the Catholic Church outside the Catholic Church because it offered something new and valuable uh, and yet on the and yet it also had this element of saying hey catholics this is what it means to live out a catholic social vision um, and to express our view of hum humanity society and the earth but i have to say that of all the countries in the world um you know our country is right up there in terms of its response of indifference relative to other countries so there does seem to be something particular uh, about its message that that is that is not well received in our own culture in our own country. Uh, in October of just last year, uh, he uh, uh, Pope Francis released Laudate Deum, which was a shorter um, uh, apostolic uh, exhortation, um, and so uh, it was done right before uh, as a run up to the um, COP treaty negotiations in Dubai. Um, and so uh, calling for meaningful progress, really urging urging people on to take um, in, uh, vigorous action to protect our climate and our earth. Um, in the process, he also really, it's very interesting the way that the United States was in some sense identified um, there. So first of all, in, in the first couple of paragraphs, paragraph three, he wrote the bishops of the United States have expressed very well this social meaning of our concern about climate change, which goes beyond merely an ecological approach, because our care for one another and care for our earth are intimately bound together. 
climate change is one of the principal challenges facing human society and the global community. The, the effects of climate change are borne by the most vulnerable people, whether at home or around the world. And then later in one of the last couple of paragraphs, he writes, if we consider that the emissions per individual in the United States are about two times greater than those of China and about seven times of the average of poorest countries, we can state that the broad change, that a broad change in the irresponsible lifestyle connected with the Western model would have a significant long-term impact. Along, as a result, along with an indispensable political decisions, we would be making progress along the path to genuine care for one another. So here's this bookend. He said, hey, the U.S. bishop said this. Hey, the U.S. is one of the uh, leading polluters and needs to take the lead on making changes. And so when the U.S. bishops uh, met this past November, their response was, So we can see this, this indifference is not limited to one sector of American society. Um, in some ways, as you, as you read this Laudate Deum, you can see that there's a different rhetorical style. It's really moving from moral appeal to a sense of really um, uh, being upset. The, the rhetorical flavor of, of, of the apostolic exhortation is different. You, we could say that the Pope sounds a bit annoyed at the lack of response. You could even say this is what the Pope pounding the table sounds like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, a, an inspiring message for some, not so much for others. For us as Franciscans, we can certainly agree that Laudato Si is the most Franciscan papal encyclical ever. Why is that? Our founder, St. Francis, uh, is, is quoted as an example, cited as an example nine different times. He cites St. Bonaventure multiple times, including Bonaventure's understanding of creation um, as a book of nature and describing Bonaventure's vision of a Trinitarian structure of all reality. It appeals over and over again to beauty and beautiful, using that term 40 times, very, very consistent with a Franciscan understanding of creation. It uses a, a Franciscan mode of moral and ethical reasoning. It's inductive and sensory. It has an incarnational and familial spirituality to it. So really, it's this really is a document that um, should find much greater home and really, I, I think, is really um, a, a, an example or it, it is best understood as a wisdom document, a Franciscan wisdom document for the, a contemporary world. So it's not just, a, I, I don't see it as just one additional social teaching document and social teaching encyclical. I think it's really a magnificent expression of the, the Franciscan spirituality in the world today. With the perspective now of 10 years, again, we can see that um, Laudato Si offers guideposts for a holistic renewal of humanity. It offers a really, first really good, clear example of how Pope Francis has integrated Catholic social teaching with pastoral conversion. They really come together. Um, he's really just as he shifted the frame by coining the term missionary disciples, the term integral ecology brings together to the social, the ecological, the pastoral together. In that sense, Laudato Si is a very helpful model of evangelization, um, in part because it doesn't assume that the audience um, recognizes Catholic magisterial authority per se. It's really, it's aimed at a universal audience, and it's a, a very helpful way for thinking about the call to conversion. So with the perspective of this decade, I would propose to you that we should stop tacking ecology on to the to-do list of theology in books and classes. Now, uh, I was just last week reading a, a very good textbook on um, pneumatology, theology of the Holy Spirit, and on like one page 147 out of 148, it said, oh yeah, pneumatology should help us think about uh, ecology too. And some of my very uh, uh, respectable theological colleagues have like the last week of class in their theology class. It's like, oh yes, we should think about theology too. And uh, my objection is that we're 
this is really an accretionary approach. We're just sort of adding another little layer in there at the end. And, um, oh, and ecology too, it's sort of like, oh, and we should pay attention to women's issues too. So uh, I think that that's the wrong uh, approach. And I think that we can now with this perspective say that um, Loud Out to Sea is an excellent starting point for thinking about Catholic social thought in the 21st century. I'm not dismissing the value of history or the importance of it, its historical development. But I think for people who are starting with Catholic social thought, Loud Out to Sea is really a much more gripping and engaging way of um, introducing Catholic social thought in the 21st century in a way that will resonate with people who are maybe not starting from a point of thinking that because the church says so, therefore I should believe. That really isn't how I think theology is done anymore. So I think that um, uh, this is what would it what would it mean for us to begin our Catholic social thought by by starting with Loud Out to Sea? I think it's a thought experiment um, worth trying, and maybe more than a theology a thought experiment. Okay, so now um, part two of this: How Pope Francis envisions renewal for the uh, for the um, uh for our um uh, how he envisions renewal for the church and for everyone really for all people so now we want to think a little bit about how um uh, this how pope francis uh thinks about and speaks about renewal not just in loud out to see okay so here are the here are the four points that i i want to illustrate for that pope francis calls everyone to re to renewal catholics everyone else so it's a universal call Renewal in the church comes about through discerning our vocations as missionary disciples and forming a synodal church. Those are those are some of the mechanisms he's proposing. Renewal in society comes about through forming a culture of encounter. And so that that act of association and our humanity encountering other human beings is a part of our renewal process. And in, as well, renewal comes about in part through care for creation, but that the act of caring for creation is an act that can help foster renewal. So it, this is a little bit of a small text, so be patient with me. I'll just walk you through this, but this gives you a, a little bit of some of the things he's been saying, because renewal is a key word in Francis's um, uh, pastoral vision, and he, he uses it quite a bit in these documents, and I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. Evangelii Gaudium came out in 2013 uses renew or renewal 37 times. I invite all Christians everywhere at this moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Loud out to see 20 times. There can be no renewal of our relationship with nature without a renewal of humanity itself. And so that's a call for moral renewal as an essential component of responding to our uh, crisis in our relationship with the earth. A great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. I'll be talking about this text some more. It's at the very beginning of chapter six, which I think is, in my view, it's the most remarkable chapter of any papal encyclical, uh, any social teaching papal encyclical, let's say. And um, it, it it's a part of a, a, a paragraph that really sort of really casts a vision forward for this for what renewal, for the importance of renewal in, in its multiple dimensions of our human experience. Fratelli Tutti uses the term 11 times. Uh, one good example is uh, global society is suffering from grave structural deficiencies that cannot be resolved by piecemeal solutions or quick fixes. Much needs to change through fundamental reform and major renewal. So this is a, a a theme that Pope Francis comes back to multiple times. So uh, here's a little bit more about how our uh, how the discernment of our vocations as missionary disciples helps bring that about. So um, he says that it's not enough to lament and condemn. As a church, we must reform and renew. He said this multiple times, and he's really, in some in some sense, he's responding to people who are despondent about the lack of stature, the the, the smaller the smaller size of the Catholic Church, 
various problems that afflict the church. He says it's not enough to lament and condemn. As a church, we must reform and renew. Again, holding that out as a positive value for us. We do reform. Uh, reform and renewal can be achieved by the practice of synodality. Part of the renewal requires overcoming uh, clericalism and over for, overcoming rigid forms of thinking, which is another obstacle to our relationship with each other and with God. And so Pope Francis, especially in these past years, has been talking about um, synodality as a form of uh, discernment that is has renewal as one of its goals. Uh, third point about how Pope Francis sees renewal, it comes about through fostering a culture of encounter. So uh, um, Pope Francis is, uh, in, especially in, Laud in uh, Fratelli Tutti, is very um, interested in talking about this these forms, uh, this form of encounter that uh, that can bring us together and bring us to draw us together. Um, and so uh, he quotes the, the example of the Good Samaritan and in um, in the Gospel of Luke, and he uses that as a way of illustrating what he what he means by encounter. And he describes encounter as having four um, four phases of four action words that go with that. Welcoming, discerning, accompanying, and integrating. And so those four little words are uh, what Pope Francis says, you know, encounter is, a, is essential part of renewal. And what does it encounter mean? He says it's welcoming, discerning, accompanying, and integrating. In some sense, those are like four responses that have like an interior dimension and an exterior dimension. And he's he's prescribing this to us as a way of thinking specifically about um, uh, thinking specifically how how we would want to um, be able to uh, uh, re uh, integrate the practice of encounter into our own um, practice uh, of of renewal. So um, the fourth point I want to talk about um, here in terms of renewal is that renewal of both the church and society comes about in part through care for creation. And so if we, um, as we think about uh, Pope Francis, he's, um, we, we can see uh, numerous examples of him um, here, such as here, um, uh, engaged in tree planting and in the act of, of care for creation itself. Um, and now I want to turn to this particular paragraph, which is the first paragraph of of loud out to see chapter six. And he, he after after describing the problems and identifying resources in our tradition and ways to help ourselves navigate our way out of this problem, he's he, in some sense chapter six, which is called uh, ecological uh, education and spirituality, um, is he's 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 proposing how this journey of renewal can be thought of um, as a process of our conversion. Uh, I tell everyone who's maybe heard about Laudato Si but hasn't yet read it to begin with the introduction, which is about 18 paragraphs and then uh, chapter six. He, uh, Pope Francis writes, many things have to change course, but it is we human beings above all who need to change. We lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging, and a future to be shared with everyone. This basic awareness would enable the development of new convictions, attitudes, and forms of life. A great cultural, spiritual, and educational challenge stands before us, and it will demand that we set out on the long path of renewal. So that's partly where I take the title of this talk from, the long path of renewal. So this text is worth kind of exploring and probing a little bit. So we lack an awareness of our common origin, our past, of our mutual belonging, our present, and a future to be shared with everyone, the future. For many of us, we pray uh, as it was, glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. And that's a good prayer. But I think the way in which Pope Francis ties awareness of the past, awareness of the present, awareness of the future, uh, to uh, to this notion of interdependence and that we are together in this 
again, a familial framework, a familiar understanding of spirituality, I invite you all to consider how you might be able to draw on this particular sentence and, and undergo that process of conversion of uh, awakening to relatedness and to inter integral ecology when you pray that little uh, mantra as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Because it's not just something we say. I mean, hopefully it's an awareness of God is active from salvation history through this present moment and to our future. And so uh, that's part of what Francis is trying to do is to align that activity of God and, our, and ourselves as a part of this conversion. So this middle phrase, this basic awareness would enable the development of new things. So when we talk about social change in the Catholic Church, I mean, this is what Pope Francis is talking about. New convictions, new attitudes, new forms of life. Okay, so he's calling for something new, renewal, new expressions of these things, new expressions of what's inside of us and how we live our lives. And he frames this as a great ch uh, challenge, one that has cultural, spiritual, and educational aspects. Okay, so um, I, I think that those are the areas where uh, that merit our attention for this kind of conversion. And so when he's talking about uh, how this how this uh, can be seen in our, um, how we can get a picture of what renewal is that he's call, calling us to, those are the different dimensions that we might consider. Now, um, uh, this care for creation, you know, in, in, in some ways we can, um, uh, we can see that Francis has brought together, brought into association, um, care for creation with um, the the sense of um, the synod, which of course is good. He's devoted so much of his attention to for the past couple of uh, past couple of years. So, if you if you will, um, um, we could say maybe we would share. We would say this picture here is a good example of the first years of Francis as a pontificate. Francis going out. Francis in an encounter where he would go out. Okay, but more recently, we might adopt this as a kind of an image of him. There he is. He's in the picture, but he's in the picture with a lot of other people. And yes, he's on a dais, but it's not very tall. Whoops, what happened there? Uh, it's it's uh, He's on a dais, but it's only about 18 inches above everybody else. Everyone else is at, at circle. And so we see this as another expression of this encounter. And so I think um, recognizing that in, in Pope Francis's mind, Synodality is a methodology of discernment that will help us with this process of um, renewal, this path of renewal, as it were. Um, last year, as he was get, as uh, he was preparing everyone for uh, uh, synod, he um, Pope Francis talked about um, how to uh, how the how the synod was associated with uh, care for creation during. Um, he he's, he highlighted the fact that the synod would take place during the at the end of the season of creation, of course, which wraps up at the end of September, early October with the Feast of Francis. He said the entire people of God is being invited to an immersive journey of synodal dialogue and conversion. And so he said that this our synodal church must be a source of life for our common home and its inhabitants. Sowing justice and peace in every place it reaches. In this season of creation, as followers of Christ and on our shared synodal journey, let us live, work, and pray that our common home will team with life once again. May the Holy Spirit once more hover over the waters and guide our efforts to renew the face of the earth. So I think it's helpful just to recognize that Pope Francis is continuing to work these themes of care for creation throughout many different elements. And he's not sort of saying, well, now we're done with that and now we're gonna go on to the Senate. No, I think that the, the, the renewal part involves multiple dimensions and a care for creation is one very important um, aspect of that uh, dimension. Okay, now I'm going to turn um, to the last section of my talk, which will be on uh, specifically on chapter six, ecological education and spirituality. And so um, my proposal to you is that chapter six of Laudato Si lays out a, a idealized instructions for
for undertaking a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage of ecological conversion. And that in we could look at chapter six in Lao Tao Tzu as a, like a primer for how to check in with ourselves about how our pilgrimage of conversion is going, how we are walking that long path of renewal. So for Franciscans, of course, pilgrimage is a very appealing metaphor. Uh, Francis called all of his followers to be pilgrims and strangers in this world. And he did so um, uh, certainly in his rule. Uh, he, he drew from uh, the second letter of Peter. And let me see if I can bring up the text. There we go. And this is uh, what he said in, the, in uh, our rule. Let the brothers not make anything of their own, neither house nor place nor anything at all. As pilgrims and strangers in this world, serving the Lord in poverty and humility, let them go seeking alms with confidence. And they should not be ashamed because for our sake, the Lord made himself poor in this world. So in the Franciscan tradition, um, we draw from, from the biblical images of pilgrimage, pilgrimage being uh, a sacred journey one takes to a holy place that results in some kind of conversion of heart and mind and life in the person who's undertaking the pilgrimage. We could also say that Francis and, um, and his followers understood Jesus as a pilgrim. Jesus came to earth to be with us and then to return to the fullness of communion with the Father in heaven, and that that invites us onto a pilgrimage journey as well. So, um, this notion of pilgrimage, I think, is a very helpful one for understanding the process of allowing ourselves to undergo encounter and conversion, or we could say walking the path of renewal. This is a very different metaphor than often we're associated with in, in church because so much of our activities is, is frankly, it's in buildings. And so there's, a, there's an unavoidable kind of bias towards thinking of the church as building as opposed to ourselves as people of God on a pilgrimage. And yet I think that's really part of what the message of Laudat to see is, is inviting us to consider. And so here's the, here's the, the little, um, a section of the table of contents that shows the, the, the headings within chapter six of Laudat to see. And what I want you to do is, what I want to do here is just walk you through what's going on in each of these little subheadings and, to, and, and invite you to, picture them as instructional guides or as, as sort of like a, an idealized guidebook for thinking about the different facets of your own renewal. And it may or may not involve a moving from point A to point B, but perhaps understanding your own conversion process, your own renewal process is taking place in phases or with different dimensions of your life. So I already read the paragraph 202, which I think is so key. And, uh, you know, Pope Francis didn't write every single word the first time for this. I mean, he, re he signed the whole letter, okay, but I think some of these, some passages uh, seem to have his voice, uh, seems to come through a little clearer. That's my sense of things. Uh, I think a, a lot of the introduction carries his, his own distinctive voice, and I think paragraph 202 does as well. So I think it's a really helpful paragraph to reflect on because it really sets us out on this journey. So Section one, toward a new lifestyle, is really calling for an inventory of how we live. It's a change in our lifestyle um, to, to live with greater humility and to get by with less and to uh, change, to, to undergo a conversion away from uh, the hyper consumer society, hyper consumeristic society. It also includes a, a very interesting section on the earth ethics which uh, some of you know, Mary Beth Ingham has been a big fan of that for some time. So it's it's looking at ways in which uh, ethical resources can be helpful for our own uh, conversion of lifestyle. The second section here is on education. And here he has a, a much more comprehensive understanding and vision of education. We might call it uh, social learning, uh, learning in a, in a much broader sense than not only in a, just a classroom. Also, especially in the family, in mass media, in communication, in the digital environment, how we learn together on the job, uh, how we re how we learn to relate to each other and to nature. So it's really uh, it, it here it calls for uh, seminaries, houses of formation to be um, exemplary in terms of a green lifestyle. 
um, it's really it's it's very uh, it's a it's a very thought provoking section. Ecological conversion is where he's explicitly calling for the resources of Christian Catholic spirituality to be marshaled to help us undergo this transformation. Joy and peace, he presents those as the fruits of this um, long path of renewal. Civic and political love is where he describes how there are opportunities for public expressions of this as members of civil society. Um, in some ways, this section evokes what John, Pope John Paul II talked about in terms of a civilization of love, bringing the values of our Catholic faith out into the marketplace, into the society to influence it by bringing that spirit of, of love to bear on it. And he also says, but not everyone's called to be involved in the political realm, but there's any number of different ways in which people can participate. And he talks about participating with our economic choices, involved in various kinds of social and and kind of group activities that help bind us together as human beings in particular places. Section six is really about liturgy and about the sacraments, and it's a lot about beauty. And it's where uh, he, he quotes Teilhard de Chardin. Chapter, uh, the section seven is where Bonaventure co comes forward again. He, he has a reflection here on the Trinity, and he, he cites Bonaventure as talk, thinking about all of created reality is done so with a kind of a, through a through trit is can be perceived through a Trinitarian lens. Again, very much relational. And the last two sections are rather short. They're about uh, Mary, the Queen of Heaven, and the sense of moving beyond the sun. Now, in another part of my life, I teach some Franciscan uh, sources, and in particular, um, the, the Mind's Journey into God, Itinerarium Mentis and Deum, which tell, in which Bonaventure presents a seven-part journey of our mind being guided into union with God. And so here, it's very interesting to view this uh, particular um, para, uh, uh, this particular chapter of the cyclical through that lens. To, I, I don't. I'm not suggesting that Pope Francis quoted or was aware of this of that classic by Bonaventure. He might have heard of it. He might have read it. I don't know. It wasn't used. At, I don't think as a as an intentionally as a as a model for this or a template. But I'm just struck by the ways in which there are these different facets of our humanity that are all being called together, woven together through the process of this long of traveling, this long path of renewal that are also about bringing us into conversion and into communion with God. And that's really what this whole chapter is really calling forth from us. Again, it, I, know, I know of no other chapter of an encyclical that um, has this same sense of um, Almost, almost like a retreat master is guiding his audience through um, a process of taking an inventory of one's life and how one can undergo um, this conversion process. So, um, um, oops, there we go. So, um, I, I, I want to now just um, conclude. Whoops, I can get rid of that little. Uh, PowerPoint and say, I'd like to conclude by um, talking just a little bit about this, um, this term that Pope Francis invented, let's say, um, uh, in the encyclical and what that might mean. And that the term is integral ecology. So uh, when you're Pope, you can invent new terms and you don't have to come up with definitions uh, for them. You have, you can sort of like leave people kind of to try to figure it out for themselves, we hope. Okay, so I puzzled over this term quite a bit. There are a lot of different ways in which people have modified the term ecology, social ecology, um, ecological ecosystem services, various ways in which people have done it. But this was a new way. Um, and there's a section in chapter four about this. But the more I reflected upon the term integral ecology, the more I realized uh, the best information we have from Pope Francis is uh, is is how, what he says about I'm saying, the best information we have from Pope Francis is by talking about St. Francis is the example par excellence of integral ecology. And he's saying, that's a good thing. That's how we should be. Again, invoking um, our father, St. Francis. 
And so to me, after some thought, I, I came to the conclusion that integral ecology is like a contemporary Catholic term that is a stand-in and could be taken to mean Franciscan spirituality. So that's what I'm going to propose to you, and I'll let you guys kind of figure out if you like this idea. But, you know, think about this. Pope Francis, who is a Jesuit still, he never, he's never publicly advocated as Pope for Ignatian spirituality. Now, I don't know about you, but like I have never met a Jesuit who wasn't trying to sell me on the Ignatian spiritual exercises. It's just what they do. I mean, it's like, what do you need? The solution is Ignatian spiritual exercises. It's like, no, that's great. I mean, I really respect what the what those offer. They're great for those who are great for it. Okay, great. But Pope Francis has never said you should practice the Ignatian spiritual exercises. Lots of words and elements and key components and insights have, have shaped who he is and his message. But he knows that if he said uh, the church should practice Ignatian spiritual exercises, he, you know, he'd be, there'd be an uproar. Why didn't the Pope just use the term Franciscan spirituality? Well, like, like what I said about Ignatian spirituality, there's a lot of people who think that Franciscan spirituality is just for Franciscans. And so that term Franciscan spirituality may not inspire the people who most need to be inspired. So instead, he points this new term, integral ecology, and um, he proposes St. Francis as the example par excellence for that a tradition for everyone in the Catholic Church and beyond to follow. Check it out for yourself. Go through and open the PDF and search for the term integral ecology um, and, and read chapter six and think and for yourself, decide whether you think I'm, you know, if, if I'm overstating it, that's so be it. But I think that a good case can be made that the Pope is calling everyone to an integral ecology, which has to do with his sense of uh, walking the path of uh, renewal, um, following the example of St. Francis. And so I will conclude my presentation just by saying that my prayer is that the Franciscan family, first and foremost, would embrace Laudato Si in its entirety, identify it as a wisdom document to guide us and to, to uh, further inspire us on, as we walk the long pilgrimage path of renewal and that we might invite others to, to travel with us. May the Lord give you peace.